And we should be recording. There we go. We are recording. Hello, everyone. I'm Carissa Kellerby. I am one of the original booksellers at Magic City Books. I'm also the manager of the Jinx Library. And I am here tonight for the book launch of Geneva, Geneva Phillips, um, Disappearing in Glimpses. Um, it is her collection of different poems and it's, it's part memoir, part um, just her personal experiences and thoughts and um, really her heart. Um, and if you haven't had a chance to purchase this yet, you can get a copy in the link in the chat. Um, and I guarantee it is something that you are definitely going to want to purchase. And so I'm here this evening to talk with Ellen Stackable, who is the executive director and co-founder of Poetic Justice, and then um, three-time Oklahoma Book Award winner and author Rilla Askew, who has written books like Fire and Beulah, and so many others. Um, if you haven't read any of her books yet, as an Oklahoman, you very much have to. So um, thank you ladies for joining me this evening. Good to be here. Happy to be here. This is really celebratory, isn't it, Ellen? Yes, it is. It's kind of unbelievable, really. <laughs> Been a journey, it quite has. a journey. It has. So, so let's just jump right into our conversation here. So. Um, so Ellen, can you tell us a little bit about Geneva and how you met her? Well, we started um, Poetic Justice is sort of a therapeutic and restorative writing program that we started at the Tulsa County Jail in 2014. And almost from the beginning, I wanted to also be able to be in the prisons. And so our first opportunity to do that came a couple years later, 2016, where we were allowed to go to Mabel Bassett which is the largest women's prison in Oklahoma. And we had two classes that first go round and it was about 25 women each. And the chaplain who was kind of overseeing the volunteer programs told us um, there'll only be a few that show up. Well, 25 showed up the first week, the second week, the third week, and Geneva was part of that. And from the very beginning, you know, I just felt a connection with her. Um, one of the first things she wrote for us was about, we were asking them to write about a safe space that they've experienced in their lives. And she chose, because she's kind of co contrarian sometimes, to write about no safe space. And she wrote about growing up in Southeastern Oklahoma and kind of really running away from her home to find a place by the Poto River where you know she was just and she wrote about that so she was in our classes after that she did our beginning class our advanced class where she started to write disappearing in glimpses and then eventually she became one of our co-facilitators helping uh, lead the classes at mabel bassett and when she moved to eddie warrior which is near tulsa she also helped uh, facilitate those and since COVID began um, we've been doing distance learning and she's been helping to coordinate that as well. So Rilla, tell us how you became involved in this journey for this book. Well, through Ellen, <laughs> she reached out to me. She sent me the manuscript. And, and as you were talking about just before we went live, you were blown away, I was blown away. When I just first started reading it, The uh, the strength of the writing, the honesty, the rawness, the, the truth of this woman's life, and just how beautifully written it is. And so Ellen sent it to me, um, and I hope Ellen will be able to tell us a bit about how it was written and how it was pr produced. And, you know, of course, Geneva wrote it out all in longhand, and then it had to be brought out of the, um, the facility and then typed and so forth, but it came to me and I became a real champion for it as well. And eventually um, we contacted Jeanetta Calhoun Mish, who has been Oklahoma's uh, poet laureate for the last couple of years and, and uh, runs a, a publishing company, Mongrel Empire Press. And so, and Janetta also was blown away by the manuscript and immediately wanted to publish it. And um, it's been, it, it seems, 
everything has seemed to just simply fall into place. It's slow. I mean, it's a very slow process, but every piece just fell in place because this, this work needs to be out in the world. Yeah. And, and one other, besides how beautiful it is and how honest it is, for me, there's a real tug because she's from Southeastern. She's from the same part of Oklahoma that I'm from. So when she's talking about place names and so forth, those, those are, she's talking about my home. You know, I was born in Poto, as a matter of fact. Oh, is that right? Huh? I yeah. I didn't know that, Rilla. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So, and then a lot of, and, and of course, her real uh, connection, Geneva's real connection to Tulsa as well. So a lot of, mm -hmm. you know, place names there and connections. So it's, it's, it's also a deeply Oklahoma book. It's so it's very much, a, it's a, it's a, it's a feminist book. It's a, it's a book of spiritual regeneration. It's uh, it's a book about all these women who are incarcerated, incarcerated in Oklahoma. As we know, Oklahoma has the highest per capita rate of incarceration of women it really in the world is, is, is my understanding. And I don't think that has changed. And Geneva's one of them. And so her, her story is every woman's story. Um, in, in, in this part of the country in so many ways. And maybe that's something you can talk about, Ellen, because you, you know a, a lot more women whose story is um, like Geneva's story. The details are different, but the, yes. the pain and the, yeah. I have to say injustice is the same. Agreed. So, so often. Yes. Yes, very much so. And and I have to say, I mean, you know, this is a is a very slim volume, but just how much um, passion and uh, just the, how much of a punch is packed into these pages is quite extraordinary. And with Poetic Justice, um, you all publish um, different volumes of works by the different women. Um, can you talk a little bit about poetic justice and just what your mission is and what you do for the ladies who are incarcerated? Well, I think it starts with a presupposition that every person in this world is of inestimable worth, whether they are in prison, whether they are out of prison, whether they are poor, whether they are whatever it is. Um, and so when we go to the prisons, we try really hard to break down the hierarchy that exists and the, the interesting part about a woman in prison is they have always been on the bottom of the hierarchy before they came to prison, while they're in prison, um, and oftentimes when they leave prison. So we try to go in as sisters, as equal people to them. And we ask them, our class is about two hours long. And we ask them to make the rules for making it a safe place. And if you have never experienced this, when you ask a woman who's in prison to make the rules for a class, the look that they give you is just kind of hard to believe. Like, really, are you faking it? It's like, no, we're not faking it. Um, so they, they have an opportunity to write about their trauma. They have an opportunity to, you know, we have all different prompts. One of them is to write a, a poem of uh, an ode of Thanksgiving for everyday things. And we've had women write things about the shower, a certain shower at Mabel Bassett or ramen noodles that they get at commissary. And they revisit their past and try to find healing in their past. And then they look to who they wanna become. So it's kind of a magical place. Um, I heard a podcast recently where they were talking about that when you are really mindful, time slows down. And we often feel like our classes don't really last two hours. They really last much longer than that because everyone in the class is completely focused on what we are doing. So we take the writing that they do, we type it up every week and we bring it back the next week so they can review it to see if there's any changes they wanna make. And at the end of every class session, which is anywhere from 10 to 12 weeks, um, we type it all up and we publish it as an anthology and give it to them at graduation. And then every year we take the best of the best from all the different facilities where we are and publish those as a yearly anthology, really as a means of showing the world on the outside that what they've seen in the media and the preconceptions that they have are not accurate. Um, you know, I walked in the first day I 
started Poetic Justice in 2014 with all these unconscious biases that I didn't know were there. I thought they would be poorly educated, ineloquent, tough, <laughs> all these different things. And it, it didn't come about. It wasn't true. Um, I mean, these are people that if you ever sat in in one of our classes, you would say, which is what I say almost every time I go, why are they in prison? That's the question. I mean, that's not what we're here to answer tonight, but that is the right. question. That is the question. <laughs> so how many facilities do you visit? Well, right now, none, because well, yes. yeah, it's March. <laughs> But we are in every woman's prison in Oklahoma. We're also in Tulsa County, um, Creek County, a um, couple others in Oklahoma. And then we also had several people reach out to us. And so we're in South Carolina, uh, San Diego, and um, Tijuana, Mexico. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, Magic City Books has been fortunate to have a few events with uh, poetic justice. And I know that um, the first one that I attended, I, you, you spoke about, um, you know, some, some of the hard facts and um, very sad statistics of female incarceration, especially in Oklahoma. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Just, I know that's kind of a broad, um, broad question, but just kind of what about that um, female incarceration caused you to start Poetic Justice? Well, the first thing I encountered was just that statistic that Oklahoma incarcerates more women than any other state, than any other country. And I read um, Susan, oh gosh, what's her last name, Rilla? The OU sociology professor, wow, I just lost it. She wrote a book called Mean Laws, Mean Lives. And it was about female incarceration in Oklahoma. And I was just stunned. Um, you know, you would have to believe one of two things, either that Oklahoma's laws are unjust or that there are a lot of bad women in Oklahoma, <laughs> which I do not believe. Um, so a lot of our laws are not gender specific, but they're gender enforced. And we have a lot of violent crimes that are not violent crimes. Geneva's violent crime, her first offense was that her children were in a car seat driving, through, did not have a car seat and they were driving through Muskogee and they got stopped. And they told her she could either take the charge of um, a misdemeanor, a failure to have a child restraint and it would be she would stay in prison in the jail there in Muskogee for several months or she could plead out to a felony offense of child abuse. And because her children had nowhere to go, she, no one to be with, she took that second charge. And, you know, because she didn't have enough money for a child seat, she got a felony child abuse charge. And there's a lot of laws in Oklahoma that really target, I believe, women and poor women. And she writes about this, just to bring it back. So it, it, Geneva's story is, is, as we've said, every woman's story so often, the, what, what she um, ha has dealt with and also the, the kind of, of, um, the kind of <laughs> transformation of her life that has happened through poetic justice is also a story that other women have gone through. But the, but the, the things that got her where she is with this, really, really long sentence um, are, they, they, it's, a, it's repeated again and again and again in this state. But what, what's true for Geneva is that she can so beautifully render it. She, t she tells it to us in this book in such honest, direct, simple way. She, the book, is, it's not I, she doesn't write it in first person. Mm -hmm. She writes it in what we call close third an unnamed she, and it, in this way also, it's um, every woman's story. And she tells us about what happens in that, in that, in that moment, and why in all of the, all of the roadblocks, wherever you turn, to wh wherever you're, whenever you're trying to, to, to change things, 
that are really just a part of the system. So we've, we've become more aware of, um, you know, intrinsic racism within, this, within the system, but there's also this intrinsic um, sexism that's also, and, and, it's, and it's worse in some parts of the country than others. And it's really bad in Oklahoma, that's just a fact. Yeah. Well, and it was interesting, you know, when she gave this to me, she gave it to me in, you know, this is a uh, part one, <laughs> that's part two, that's part three. And she would send them home with me after I was at Mabel Bassett with her. And as you can see, it's all handwritten. And I thought what was so interesting when I sent the type version to Rilla, she said, you know, I don't think there's a lot that needs to change here. Which I think, you know, as somebody who loves writing and tries to be a writer, I, I, it's hard for me to relate to that level of writing. But, you know, as I was reading it each time, she would finish one volume and, and it was sort of like this break of a few weeks, which was really hard because I struggle a lot with the Geneva I know today and the Geneva she writes about. You know, it was really, really hard for me because the Geneva I know today is a woman of faith, a woman of hope, just a, a beautiful woman. You know, she's honest and she's funny. And so reading her story was just really difficult for me, honestly. And, uh, you know, one day, the beginning of it is that personal archaeology where she writes about a phone conversation and that's with me where I said it's confusing it's hard and so this is the part that really touched me um this these few lines where she said I am plucking loose I am finger braiding a single thread of hope thin as a strand of hair can I spin it into gold and so as I looked back through the book when she finally finished it, I realized there really was that, that hair width of hope all the way through it that was gold. And, and then I could come to terms with it. So you, you showed us those notebooks. So in, in the book, she has dates um, next to the different entries. So are those... Um, dates associated with when she wrote that or is it um you know more where when the things in that selection it's when it happened okay and and that was the part that you know for me was it reminded me almost you know I've taught English for a number of years and it reminded me almost of magical realism because when I read magical realism I have to suspend my control over time in order to read it and so Geneva's book did the same thing to me, where I just had to accept that we were going from, you know, 1992 to 2012, and then we would go back again. And when I, when I was willing to accept it that way, and actually she, she talked about that when I uh, talked to her on the phone the other day, you know, really, you had a really good description of, what did you call it, chunks or something like that she wrote in? Shards. Shards? shards. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're like shards. Great and pieces of, you know, shards of truth <laughs> and, and uh, or like a mosaic and how it's put together um, in, in, in a really lyric way, but they're juxtaposed. There's still a narrative. The narrative is not chronological, but, mm -hmm. the, but, but the way they are put together and how they are juxtaposed against one another is, is what tells the whole, but, but, they're put, but they're laid out, or if you read through it chronologically, it's the way memory works. It's how what's it's what's happening in our heads when we're we're carrying our whole lives in our heads all at once simultaneously. But we just remember this incident in 1984 and that incident in 2012. And um, but the there's a natural. I assume um, Ellen and so Ellen, you know, sent me the typed manuscript. We looked at it, and then during the process. Um, Janetta sort of relied, Janetta Calhoun Mish relied on me to do a lot of the editing. So I've been in, in conversation yeah. with Geneva for months now. And, we, and I finally got approved to go visit her like about one week before everything was locked down with COVID. So I'm still not getting to go see her in person, but we talk on the phone. And so we've done the entire process of editing this and it's copy editing it and all those things, which is a a, a, quite a task to do by the phone and back and forth through through snail mail. Um, 
what I get, what I was getting ready to get at is uh, Geneva, she, she, I mean, um, yes, she put this in the order essentially that it's in. Is that not true, Ellen? Yes. I mean, it has its own order yep. that is not chronological, but it came to us that way. We didn't need to say, oh, this goes here and that goes there. It was done. Well, and she's pretty, she can be sort of stubborn about things like that. I would say, you know, wouldn't it make more sense if you did this chronologically? She goes, nope, that's not how I'm going to do it. And, and she told me just yesterday, part of the reason she wrote it this way so that the reader had permission to step away. She said, I realized that there was a lot for people to take in. And so I wanted them to feel like they could step away if they needed to for a moment and then come back when they were ready, which is, you know, wow. I mean, I didn't read it that way. <laughs> I read it, you know, almost all in one sitting. And then I would just be like, whew, I need a break. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just gonna make um, a shout out. We do have um, a Q and A portion. So if any of you watching have any questions that you would like to ask, you can just put that in the Q and A. Um, and I'll be referring back to that every once in a while as well. Um, we do have one in so far. Um, so what was the process of finishing the book like? Did Geneva send a finished manuscript or did Ellen get it in pieces as she wrote, which is what it seems like she got those notebooks. Um, did she have people to workshop it with in Mabel Bassett and what kind of decisions did you, Ellen, um, have to make um, when you were typing up or whoever was typing up the, the handwritten manuscript because there's some specific formatting in here. So was she, were you able to sort of, um, did she have it formatted on the page the way obviously she wanted it typed out as well? Is that question for Ellen? It's, it's kind of for both of us. Go ahead, really, you jump in. I mean, this is what it looks like. I mean, it was really, you've never seen these and I can't wait till we can get together in person. <laughs> but it was, she, she did a rough draft in prison. She did not workshop it. Um, she did it herself and then she would come back. She, she told me she would pray over it. And then she would come back and do the final, which she sent with me all in you know, one volume. This is part three, disappearing in glimpses. Um, and then our volunteer who typed it up, God bless her. <laughs> um, we sent it to Rilla that way. And, and it hasn't changed appreciably somewhat. And um, when it went into the typeface, this, there were some changes in terms of slightly in terms of formatting, um, you know, might be juxta, you know, um, the margin might come over, you know, over to the left or where, whereas she had it centered or, or something like that, but not very many changes, just a few, a few tweaks here and there. One of the, one of the suggestions that I made with her, because there are a lot of he's in here, a lot of unnamed he's, <laughs> and, but they're different men, you know, so, <laughs> uh, 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 so I was like, so is that, is that the, no, is that the first, you no, know, I, I was just like confused. And so she, um, she still didn't want, of course, name names. So she uh, found ways to um, identify them so that if it's, if it's like the, the, the father of her children, you know, that he, he had a particular identifier. And so if that's who she was talking about, you know, then, you, then, then the reader would know. And then if it was somebody else, they would know. Um, that's about the only thing that I can remember that I really said, this is, this is confusing. Well, and there were a couple of, um... There's a, a specific kind of argot that um, people use in prison, and it varies from prison to prison. And so one of them was um, kiting. And so you had her change that. Kiting means when you send a kind of an uh, underground message from someone in one part of the prison to the other, or to someone on the outside and you're not supposed to. So I think you had her change that phrase too. Yeah. Yeah, because it didn't want to be explained, but... but. You know, in other words, what you just said, you can't take time out of this lyric right, right. piece to explain to, 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 to lay people what that is. So um, I think that sort of we've, in a sense, almost answered because we had already been talking about that process to, to that, that questioner in terms of it, it came, 
it was fully born like Athena from Zeus's head, right? That's good. I like that. <laughs> That's good. So our, our next question, um, and uh, you had had a conversation with Geneva recently, Ellen, um, just kind of about uh, what writing is for her and, and where her desire to write came from. Um, someone asked, did she have any previous writing experience before this book? Well, she says that she started writing when she was about 12 and always wished she could become a writer. Um, she has sent home with me at various times because one of the things that sometimes happens in prison is what they call shakedown. And it's when you have to take everything that you own into about a foot by a foot square box. And so right before she was going to move from Mabel Bassett to Eddie Warrior, she sent home some of her notebooks with me. And they're just chock full of her writing. So I think she's been writing for a number of years, um, but really a self-taught writer. Um, when we first started Poetic Justice, we liked to call ourselves writing mentors. And then very quickly, I realized that we were writing partners because most of the women I was working with were probably better writers than I am. So. So oh, I think our next question, and I think this is a good time um, to read one of her selections. Um, Rilla, if you wanted to read the one that you had picked out. Okay, yeah, this is very early in, um, in the collection. It's two, number two, it's called Dimensions and the date is 2012. She lies awake, uncomfortable she shifts on the bunk. Her bones clink and tinkle, old dusty bottles shuddering on a shelf. Her memories are matchsticks, which she strikes against the darkness, old stories and ghosts remembered or repurposed, reconstructed from the limited reflections of her perspective, fluid dimensions of once, then, when, and now, traveled into, through, and between by breath, thought, or dream, she vanishes and reappears in glimpses. The only place she cannot reach is forward into the future, where she grows indistinct, uncertain and diminishing. Still she tries, and in trying, she becomes an indistinguishable ending in, in a search of a place to begin. Wow, wow. It's just so beautiful. And I only got a chance to read a few of these, but I cannot wait to dive into this, the whole book um, as we were kind of talking about earlier before we started this, um, it's just such, it's really indescribable, like just the feelings and emotions that it evokes, um, and her phrasing and her, her understanding of craft is just so masterful that I, I really hope that, and someone else has commented that um, that she's able to somehow see this presentation and you know be able to um, to know the reception that her book is having um, because um, you know someone says I can't help but note that she's unable to participate in her own book launch, um, which is just it's tragic. Um, and I know that you've talked to her quite a bit in the last couple of days. How was she uh, feeling knowing that this event was happening tonight? Well, she told me the other day that um, the equivalent of the water cooler talk in prison is the locker talk. And she has a really close friend at um, Eddie Warrior named Michelle. And so they were sitting around, they were talking about what a terrible year 2020 had been. And they were kind of commiserating with each other and all of a sudden, Geneva said, but I published a book. And I have a TV. And I have boots, <laughs> which are all, you know, each one of those are just really big deals. And she goes, I guess it wasn't so bad after all. You know, and I, I think she's resigned to it. She's always worried that she will come across unclear or ineloquent. And I just reassure her that that's not true. Um, I mean, honestly, I just counter as one of my closest friends. Um, 
can't wait for the time when I can see her again, when we can go back in the prisons. I can't wait for the time when I can see her on the outside. We can just sit and have a cup of coffee together. <laughs> the three of us, Rilla. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I'm looking forward even just when they open up and we can, we can, we can go see her there as well. Yeah. yeah. Who's, who's, when that's going to be. So and you had one, Ellen, about hope that you wanted to read. Yeah, this actually isn't in the book, but I, I just feel like this has been such a um, touchstone for who Geneva is and ever, since I have known her. And it's called Hope. It says, um, hope is a shining thread that binds me to life. It is a knitted ribbon that I wind through the breath of my prayers. Hope is an impregnable shelter against dark, crushing moments. Hope is the drum that turns the earth, a steady, deep rhythm each newborn recognizes as a heartbeat. Hope is the power to rectify wrongs. Hope refuses to be silenced. It is hope that gets up one more time. Hope offers help, kindness, a hand, a hug. Hope builds bridges between colors, ideas, and dreams. Hope honors, encourages, and applauds every effort towards goodness. It comforts failures and always, always tries again. Hope is an anchor. It is the keystone upon which all things hinge. Hope is the center that holds when all else fails. Which now that I'm reading it really fits our year 2020, doesn't it? You know, and that's what I have seen, you know, as I read about the number of times, you know, Geneva faced death or really died and was revived. You know, the struggles she's had since childhood with um, abuse and all other things, you know, I'm just, this is what I think about her. Um, she has come out of all that, not cynical, not hateful, not hopeless, but filled with hope. You know, how much more should I be if she is? You know, she is the one that teaches me about hope. And that's how I know her too. And I, of course, don't know her anywhere, anywhere near the, the way that you do. But so when um, so many women like 95% of the women at Eddie Warrior tested positive for COVID. She, yes. Geneva had, had had COVID. She, as you were saying, she doesn't even have her sense of smell and taste back yet. And that's the only time I heard anything like getting down in her yeah. voice at all, which I don't even know if I could have survived all of that. When they're, they're locked on, they, they're sitting on their bunks 24 hours a day. That's it. So the way it's set up for a set of warrior is it's an open dorm. So there are literally hundreds of bunks in a dorm and they're within three to four feet of each other. So when they're locked down for months, they have one hour for bathroom or whatever and the rest of the 23 hours they have to sit on their bunks. And so when they transferred women in from another facility, and they weren't tested, almost immediately women started getting COVID at Eddie Warrior. And then they started moving women around. So imagine having COVID and then finding yourself a refugee. You don't know where you're going. It's two in the morning. They say, pack up, you're going somewhere. And so it was so disruptive. And you know what I, the other part I love about Geneva is that she doesn't, she's not willing to just let things get by. You know, she is willing to fight the system, not in a way that brings harm to herself or to other people, but that produces change. Um, and so she was interviewed with our local NPR station. Um, and we started, to, honestly, we started to see some change, not at Eddie Warrior, but at least for other facilities that they adopted some protocols that I felt like were really so much safer than what she had experienced. So, so, so we just, I was thinking about our audience out here. I mean, so there's, there's a, this beauty of this language and there's the harrowing um, upbringing that Geneva had and her, and her early years and, and the 
the things that she writes about so honestly. I, I use the term raw and to some of the other people who um, gave blurbs for the book use the term haunting and it's all of those things. But then there's this resilience, this toughness at the bottom of it. And I think how many of us would endure that? How many of us would be able to sit on our bunk four feet away from women on either side for months? It's, it's, wow. I don't know. Yeah. It's and really then make hard. art out of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and someone poses the question. So was her insistence on making this um, more episodic as far as the, you know, instead of linear in her uh, choice of the, you know, when she, um, how she laid out the book, was that, uh, do you think, a way to bring the readers closer to sort of her internal, um, you know, the way she thinks about her life and the way she thinks about things. It's, it's more episodic rather than linear. Good question. Rilla, thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> Pass. No. Well, I think, you know, she, she's, she's dealing very much with a memoir. And so she's dealing with memory. And this is how memory is not episodic or linear. We we've, we've form it into that when we're trying to put it into a novel or a narrative in some way. But so where she's pulling from is a, is a mosaic as, our, as most of us, are, that's how our memory works. So I don't know in other, other ways if that's how she necessarily thinks, but I think in terms of what she, when she knew what she was doing was telling her story, she was pulling from this memory and this memory and this memory. And honestly, that was the hard part for me. And I tried to talk her into chronology and she <laughs> it did not go well. <laughs> I lost that argument to say the least. Um, and I'm kind of glad I did because I feel like if you read the book, you read it on her terms and not yours. And you're right, really. It really is a reflection of how memory works because memory explodes in all different directions. We're ambushed by things when we least expect it. So exactly. And it's also works for, for me as a reader, it works in juxtaposition. So when I read one really tender, the one of, where she's cooking with her son and, mm -hmm. and making baking and, and that uh, just a beautiful tender moment with, um, you know, next to something that's really, really harrowing. And that juxtaposition is also really powerful as opposed to looking, you know, reading it in a you know, with a narrative arc that builds to, you know, a climax and falling action and so forth, which is not really how it works. You know, there are little victories and little wow. defeats. That's good. Yeah, that's how life works. You know, so one of the um, volumes ends with the story of Samson, her dog. And honestly, that was one of the ones that I was just like, <laughs> I don't know if you've ever experienced this when you're reading a book, but there's to me, a really good book is where you're at some point ready to just <laughs> throw it against the wall. <laughs> and when I read that one, it's about a dog that they had and they didn't have enough means to feed the dog. And she just talks about the agony of seeing this dog fade away before her eyes. And oh gosh, it just, it was so hard for me to read that. And then it stopped and I'm like, no, I need, I need to know what happens next. <laughs> Yeah, I, and I think, I, I, I'm sure that our listeners here tonight are interested in the subject matter. They're, they're not um, squeamish about being able to go into difficult places in terms of reading. But I just want to emphasize, because we're talking about how much of, this, how much of the material is hard and painful to read. And it's also so beautiful. And, and because the whole narrative, that, that is one way it's a progression. It moves toward hope by the end of the book. Yes. And it, it, we're left at the very end, understanding, seeing the Geneva that you're talking about right now, Ellen, you know, and not, not, not the one who suffered the things that she suffered so much during the years that she's writing about. So that's- No, well, and that's, that's what kind of struck me. You know, I remember talking to her and I said, you know, I'm amazed at who you are today. I'm amazed that you survived with so many hard things that you have gone through. And when I look at who you are today, 
you know, and I even, I remember talking to a friend of mine who's a counselor about this, you know, saying I was having real difficulty putting those two together. And she said, well, this is who she has become because of all those things. You know, a person of resilience, a person of hope, a person with humor and just an, kind of a, a well of love for other people that's amazing. So, so when this, her, her writings began and they, you knew that it was going to be turned into a book, um, what was it like to deal with any sort of prison regulations on, you know, for incarcerated authors? Did you have any difficulties in, in being able to get it published from that standpoint? And is she able to receive any of the, the royalties for this? Well, you know, poets make so much money. <laughs> writers <laughs> are so wealthy and um, I think there was concern that Geneva was going to get wealthy on this book uh, no I don't think there's been any difficulty at all we sent the you know I sent the galleys back and forth through the mails and of course they check everything in terms of the mail they they the the they knew they know we had to send the contracts back and forth through the mail and so forth so they know about all that. The money does not go directly to her. It goes, if you know, what, what royalties she will be able to receive from Mongol Empire Press uh, will go to an account that her mother, um, it, it'll go, it'll basically go to her, to her mom. And uh, so if her mom wants to put some money in, in her account right. or canteen and those kinds of things, I mean, uh, where she might, you know, th that will happen, or she can use it to buy more copies of the book to give away to all her friends, like she's been doing so far. Yeah, that's, right? that's true. Yes, I have a list. She sent me a list this week of all the people she wants um, to get the book. So I'm going to order copies from Janetta and send those out. And a lot of them are women who are friends of hers. Um, she has two copies. She wants to go to the library at Mabel Bassett, which I thought was amazing. Um, the only rule that they have is you cannot profit off of your offense. And so in the book, Geneva is very careful not to really address the reason she is currently in prison. And, and that is the reason why. Mm -hmm. uh, but other than that, no, they have um, prisoners are weirdly in the status of being slaves and also having some rights. And it's oftentimes really confusing. So is Geneva the first alum of Poetic Justice um, to be published in her own book? In her own book, yes. Um, we have several women that have been published through PEN America, which works with um, incarcerated individuals. And they have published through that. But Geneva's is the first book. <laughs> You're right. That's amazing. And she started on her second one already. So got oh, in right. with COVID, but she's working on her second one. That's good to hear. That was going to be another one of my questions is, is she planning to write another collection? So I'm glad to hear that. Um, so the, the last question that we have here um, is uh, someone has bought Geneva's book tonight. Thank you for doing that. And there's uh, the link is still there in the chat if you want to purchase yours. Um, and so if somebody wanted to write her, to let her know what her book meant to them and, and how, how they felt about her book. Is there a way that, that somebody could get in touch with her to share that? Absolutely. Um, it, she is at Eddie Warrior Correctional Center in Taft, Oklahoma. So we'd write to her there and then you just need to attach her DOC number, which is 427-266. Is that backwards or just for me? Um, no, that's right, yeah. Okay, 427-266. So you would write Geneva Phillips, 427-266, um, Eddie Warrior Correctional Center, and the address in Taft. And um, it should get to her. Um, I have made friends with the male person at, at Eddie Warrior who now knows me. So um, that's helped. And Taft, Oklahoma is literally a trailer, the uh, post office there, which is weird because there's almost 900 women at Eddie Warrior. And she would love to hear from people. Oh yeah. So, so we did have one more question pop in. Um, how much longer uh, will she be incarcerated? 
I think she has seven more years. I don't like to look at it because it depresses me. Um, she applied for commutation this year and was denied commutation. Um, Oklahoma is beginning finally to commute some sentences, which means lessen them with the Board of Paroles, but so far it's nonviolent offenses. Um, the only exception to that was um, Tandaleo Hall, who had failure to protect when her boyfriend almost killed her baby. And he was released and she got 30 years in prison. So that's the first step in kind of um, seeing some change in gender applied laws. But um, I think Geneva feels like she'll probably stay there and she's hoping to start uh, at Rose State College uh, this year and work towards a college degree. I told her she should teach at the university level. She'd be amazing. And if anyone wants to, would be interested in getting involved um, with poetic justice or helping you in any way, what's the best way that they can do that? They can contact us at um, our website, poeticjustice.org or info at poeticjustice.org. Um, we are currently doing um, distance learning, as I said, and so we welcome, um, we, we can't let men write to women. It's just really complicated and <laughs> hard to explain. <laughs> um, but we would love to have more women helping us with that. We now have um, almost 15% of the population of women that are incarcerated in Oklahoma that are doing our distance learning. And we try to pair them up with just a good human on the outside. Um, so you don't have to be a writer. You can just be a person who cares and we can pair you up. Wonderful. Well, thank you ladies again for joining us this evening. Um, and I hope all of you who tuned in this evening have purchased your copy or are going to purchase your copy of the book. It's well worth it. Um, the holidays are coming up, so great gift as well. Um, and thank you so much. Um, and we will see you at our next event. Thanks, Thanks. everyone. Thanks.